Okay, so our last section is on helminths and arthropods. So helminths are parasitic worms. Something that most of us have probably not encountered. And there's three main groups. There's the tapeworms, the flukes, and together these two are called, <clears throat> excuse me, flatworms. So they have a flattened body and they also have suckers or hooks that allow them to attach to their host. And the third class is the nematodes or the, whoops, roundworms. And just like protozoa, um, they can come in different stages of their life cycle. Um, so these are showing the worms. Here's um, showing a cyst. So worms can sometimes form cysts also, which is that protective coat. There are larval stages and there are eggs. Okay. So this, can you imagine? Um, I don't know if that's actually true, but tapeworms can grow many, 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 many feet in length. So how do you get a parasitic worm? So you can accidentally ingest the larvae or the cyst from a um, host. So this is where people worry sometimes about eating um, contaminated pork or pork that hasn't been cooked all the way. They also worry about that for um, protozoa more in this country. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some worms can actually dig into your skin. So in less developed countries, a lot of people walk around barefoot all the time. And if there are certain types of um, helminths in the soil, they can actually just dig right into your heel or your bottom of your foot and infect that way. Fecal oral route again is ingestion of contaminated food, water that has these worms or larvae in them. Um, and some are also um, transmitted by the arthropod vectors, so insects. Helminths have unique lifestyles, um, or lifestyles, <laughs> life cycles. And this is not for you to re memorize. Remember, this is just to kind of get an appreciation of how some of these are pathogens. So this is a tapeworm. It's showing you the suckers that attach to your intestine. Tapeworms basically absorb nutrients from their host, and that's um, how it causes pathology. And the way you can get it is by um, eating some contaminated meat. So the larval stage is ingested and then the tapeworm grows. Now most worms are not reproducing in the human host, but a lot of times they are producing eggs that are then um, leave through the fecal route um, in, from the person back into the environment and um, around we go. Nematodes or roundworms, um, you can see this is a subcutaneous infection, so right under the skin. The adults are producing um, these microfilari, which are really egg sacs. Um, and in this case, they're showing you a nematode that is um, taken in and transmitted by a fly, so a biting fly. Um, and the um, growth and reproduction is actually happening in the fly. Uh, this is an example. This hookworm is one of the ones that can enter right in through your skin. Um, most worms live in our intestines. What's interesting is that many go through the lungs, 
So for instance, um, this filariform will penetrate the skin and then hit the lungs. And the reason it hits the lungs is so that you cough up and then swallow, right? And so then it gets into your intestines. Um, so it's a very interesting pathway to get to the right part of the host. And it wants to be in your intestines so that it can produce eggs. And then you poop out the eggs and then it's in the environment. And here we go. Um, one helminth, um, a nematode that you may have heard of before, is the one that causes elephantitis. And this is transmitted by mosquitoes. And what happens is this worm basically clogs up lymphatic system. So this person is accumulating all this fluid. I can't even imagine how heavy that must be on this poor person. Um, so it damages your lymph system. You get severe swelling of arms, legs, and genitals. Kind of interesting where it um, sticks in there. And it's very hard to treat. So again, helminths are eukaryotic cells. Therefore, they are challenging to treat because we are also eukaryotic cells. Several of the anti-worm medications actually work at paralyzing the worm so that it lets go and you can flush it out of your system. What's very interesting is the work to cure or get rid of these diseases is actually by helping people understand how they're transmitted and then preventing transmission. Pinworms, I just had to throw up here because apparently this used to be an issue and um, yes, this is a butthole of a person. Those little white things are these microscopic little worms. Or, well, I guess they, they're not quite microscopic because as the story goes, um, moms used to tape a piece of tape across their child's tush and come back and pull off the tape and see if worms were stuck to them. So at night, apparently, the worms kind of crawl out and um, you can see them. Uh, these are common in kids, although I don't, I never hear of it now. My, my kids didn't get it, but um, these little worms can be treated with over-the-counter medication. Here's a tapeworm. Here's a guy removing a tapeworm. So tapeworms can live for years um, with you. And um, here's another picture of that head that sticks on there and, and holds on. And so the medication to get rid of this is to paralyze the worms so that it lets go. Um, some people, and you can Google this, apparently sell tapeworms as a diet. So since the tapeworms are absorbing nutrients through their skin from you, um, people have been known to actually infect themselves on purpose with a tapeworm in order to lose weight. Have not tried that one. Um, and I probably am not saying this right, but schizosomia. Now I was practicing schizosomiasis, maybe. Um, is actually a very, the second most socioeconomically devastating parasitic disease. So malaria is number one. We talked about that protozoa. This one, and you can see the worm under the skin of this person. Um, this one causes um, in children poor growth, learning difficult difficulties. It can infect organs. Um, it basically keeps people immobile and therefore they can't farm, they can't work, um, and so it causes economic issues that way. What's happening is the worms actually um, 
live in these snails. They develop in the snails. And then as the people are walking through the water where the snails live, the worms come out and go in through the human skin. So what people have tried to do to, again, prevent this is to um, explain to people how this happens and to try to prevent by changing um, behavior. What's super interesting, I think, is that in developed countries, in more developed countries, there is a higher incidence of autoimmune diseases and allergies. And the hygiene hypothesis says that we think this may be because we keep our kids too clean. Our sanitary practices has eliminated exposure to these worms especially. And so we're not getting our immune system developed like we used to. And so there are treatments to try to combat autoimmune diseases and allergies by actually taking helminths in. Okay, so you're purposely infecting yourself. Um, some is, sometimes it's delivered as a shot, um, as a drink or applied to the skin. This is available outside of the US. It's only in clinical trials here in the US. Um, but the papers I have glanced at, they have talked about it relieving multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, lupus, eczema, eczema, sorry, and they're looking at perhaps certain types of type 1 diabetes that are autoimmune. So pretty interesting um, helminth therapy. Again, you're um, purposely infecting yourself with some worms so that your immune system will become activated and potentially stop attacking yourself. All right, our last group, and these aren't really pathogens. We're not looking at them as pathogens, but we are looking at them as vectors or method of transmission. These are the biting insects. So they like to feed on humans and animals, get blood meals, and by doing that, they can transmit um, pathogens. So protozoa, some can be transmitted, some helminths can be transmitted, and some viruses can be transmitted with these different arthropod vectors. And so we'll talk about, well, let me make sure. Maybe we're not talking about it. Maybe we're talking about it in my virology class about should we get rid of mosquitoes and prevent virus disease transmission? And what happens to the ecology if we do that? Um, lots of interesting science going on looking into how we can knock down these vectors as methods of transmission. I just wanted to put up some what I thought pretty interesting um, data so these arthropods, these vectors of disease, they are transmitting um, yellow fever and the trypanosomes and leishmania and malaria and dengue fever and Chagas, some encephalitis. So they're actually um, transmitting almost as much, right, as tuberculosis, which is a bacterium, and here's HIV AIDS. So the total number of human deaths due to specific vector-borne diseases is at about 23%. That's huge. This slide is just to let you see that mortality due to major vector-borne diseases up top here and burden Okay, so like I talked about, socioeconomic. So these are all um, vector-borne 
diseases. You can see R in the Americas, really South America, Chagas disease is the biggest one. Malaria in the rest of the world. And this is say, excuse me, explaining in the thousands the burden, right? So the socioeconomic burden of having these infections and how it takes people out of the workforce, um, putting a burden on the healthcare system. So there were, we're not going to talk about arthropods as pathogens themselves, but as the vectors for transmitting these pathogens. Right. So what I want you to think about from this week's set is the challenges of dealing with each type of pathogen. Right. So we've talked about bacteria and viruses and fungi and protozoa and helminths, and we're going to continue discussing Next, how they cause disease, how they're spread, and then um, week four, we'll start talking about some immunology. So how do we try to fight the infection? Remember, you have homework due um, on this. It is posted on Canvas, and I will have more lectures for you next week. Thanks. Ooh.